Hey everyone, it's Mark, your firefighter realtor and auto state investor. Today I have a special guest on, Joe Cacciapaglia, and I found him on Twitter. He's an amazing follow. He is an investor, he does short-term rentals, he's a property manager. But Joe, why don't you tell my audience a little bit about yourself? Hi, and thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Um, I've been in real estate for uh, since 2005. I bought my first investment property. It's also the first time I got my real estate license. Um, just a minor correction, although you know I do work for a property management company. On a day-to-day -day basis, I'm not managing properties. I'm really out there helping uh, work as a you know as a real estate agent, helping our our clients find their next properties or um, sell the ones that they have. So, it, you know, a lot of my content is about property management. It's because I work with them every day, uh, but it's not, uh, it's, it's not really what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I'm probably the most overeducated realtor. I like to just throw this in there. I, I don't know. Uh, I have a master's degree in land economics and real estate. I worked on the commercial side, um, I realized it's just not nearly as fun as working with individual investors who want to buy their first duplex or fourplex or, you know, piece of land that they're going to flip. Um, and that affects their lives so much more than when I worked with, you know, REITs that are buying their hundredth building or something like that. Um, I also was an attorney for a short period of time and did a lot of, um, you know, just did uh, real estate related work there. And so I, I feel like I have a, a, a much different perspective on real estate because of that background. Um, and it's uh, so one, I, I am definitely way overeducated for what I'm doing, but I think it, it helps me see a lot of the risk that a lot of people in my role sort of ignore. Uh, and it's um, you'll find, I think, you know, through our discuss discussion that uh, um, that's, that's my main goal, right? I'm always looking at the downside uh, always trying to figure out, you know, what um, what could go wrong with these properties, right? Because it, it's it's easy to get caught up in the excitement of I'm going to get into real estate investing, I'm going to buy a million doors, and uh, everything is going to be perfect. And so um, I think I think that background on me is important to understand. Um, one, you're always going to get these ridiculous, long-winded, and nuanced answers from me. Um, but the other is uh, that that's that's the lens that I'm looking at real estate from. It's a much more, um, I think it's a, a, you know, obviously I'm in this industry. I think it's a fantastic way to build wealth, but I also think it needs to be, um, I, I like to temper some of the excitement that clients have on it, especially when they're brand new investors. Yes. I mean, that's what I love about your, your t information on Twitter. You're always kind of calling people out. You're always talking about, like, the, like you said, the downside, and it really seems like you're targeting or trying to help newbies or new investors, you know, get started, understand that it's not as, you know, maybe passive or it's not just this easy game to get into. But let's kind of circle back that you're talking about, you know, your overly educated boss or, you know, for this for real estate. So was real estate always part of the plan or you, it just kind of fell into place for you? Like, were you headed down a different path in the beginning? So, um, uh, yeah, I'll give you, uh, I, I don't know that I really often share this backstory, but, you know, right after high school, I went and joined the Navy. Um, I did, uh, four years there worked in, um, I did, I worked, I was in SWIC, uh, and ended up, you know, deploying to Columbia a few times. We basically had a, uh, counter drug type mission there, although it was, you know, under like foreign internal defense. So we'd go and train Colombian Marines. On that but so when i got done with that time i went and joined you know when i went to college and thought um thought i was going to you know do get a four-year degree and then go in either the uh, fbi or cia i was going to do something like that uh got, went in with a uh, philosophy major and like had no no idea about real estate whatsoever at the time um Somewhere along the way, my funding through the GI Bill got hung up and I ended up dropping out because I didn't have enough money to make it through one more semester. And this that was sort of like a catalyst that made me realize, like, I need to figure out more about money uh, and maybe 
um, you know, I, uh, I didn't have any sort of financial education. My parents were, were, were both pretty terrible with money. Um, and, uh, so that, that sort of made me have a mindset shift. I started reading a lot of books about money and whatnot and, um, switched my degree to accounting and started working for an accountant and just, um, all of his clients were real estate developers and investors and like all of the most wealthy people that he, that he helped uh, had something to do with real estate. And so that's when that switched for me. Um, I, and from that point forward, I've really always focused on real estate. Um, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, I actually tried wholesaling at the time. Well, because I, I, I got back into college, you know, once I got my money stuff figured out a little bit, I tried wholesaling, um, you know, decided to go to this real estate or uh, land economics and real estate master's degree program. And so finished, you know, finished college where I was and then and moved on to that. Got my real estate license at the same time. I actually bought my first investment property with the job I had for the summer between, um, college and grad school, which is just, you know, a sign of the times. I was 2005. You could get a loan. Uh, you didn't have to have a real job. You know, you could get a loan extremely easy. It was, it was ridiculous. Um, and so from that point forward, I've always been focused on um, real estate. Even when I went back and got my law degree, it was mostly, um, it was 2012. I had been doing a commission only uh, commercial mortgage brokerage, which was still really slow at the time. Um, and also uh, uh, I should mention, I have a chronic disease. So uh, at the time it wasn't diagnosed properly yet. And so my doctor just kept telling me, oh, I think you're just too stressed. And I was working long hours. Uh, so I was like, okay, well, let me take a few years off, go to school again, because uh, I've always just loved school. Um, and it, it turned out that wasn't the answer, but it, you know, it, it got me to go to law school and then become an attorney for a short time. Uh, that l license is retired. So nothing I'm saying is going to be legal advice ever. Um, but so, uh, yeah, it, you know, it was a really, I only did that for about 10 months, but it was interesting. I worked in a law firm in North Jersey. We mostly did um, really big development deals in New York city and in New Jersey. Um, so I got to, learn a lot about how title works and, um, you know, syndications, the partnership documents and all that stuff. Uh, so, yeah, you know, it's, I've always been in real estate, but uh, because of the timing of, you know, I got out of grad school, went and had my first job in real estate in uh, December 2006. I was working for a public REIT um, as both in acquisitions analysis and uh asset management. And I was really interested in the acquisitions, but um, they were smart enough not to be buying anything because it was, you know, really peak. It was, like I said, December, 2006. I only lasted there for like three months and it was like, okay, I got to go somewhere where they actually buy stuff, uh, which was my dumbest move ever. Um, and uh, yeah. It, and then went somewhere where I was, you know, completely commission based uh that place actually ended up um, going under less than a year later. And I, I jumped jobs a whole bunch because um, just the times, a lot of those companies went out of business. Um, I worked in one place where they laid off 90% of my department. And so that was no fun after everybody else was gone because I had a lot more work. So, you know, just uh, it was, uh, it's always been real estate and I've always invested on the side. Um, and I, and I've had my license since 2005 and like helped my family members get into investing. Um, but I haven't, hadn't been just full-time helping, you know, new investors and individual investors. Uh, they're not all new. I mean, I have some people that have been investing with me for a long time now, uh, but I've been doing this full-time here in San Antonio for, since 2018, um, I know, like I told you, I mean, I'll just, I'll just ramble on for a long time if you don't stop me. No, no. Um, so, yeah. So I, I was going to ask, cause I heard Jersey, I heard you talking about Jersey. Yep. So, but currently you are in San Antonio and that's primarily where you invest and that's where you kind of help new investors. Yes. Yeah. So I had, I've been 
I've moved for markets, right? Like I've moved because I wanted to be in different markets or for jobs. Um, when I decided to come to San Antonio, this is 2018, I was already thinking, geez, we're really due for a downturn. You know, things have been good for quite a while. Um, you you know, people were already talking about it. And um, because I went to graduate school in Texas, I had a lot of friends in Texas markets. And even though I had been in like New Jersey, New York and Philly, most of my career, um, I had worked in Houston for a little bit, but I had always done deals in Texas because on the commercial side, especially in financing, you can, you can do stuff everywhere. And so I had a lot of data on, um, you know, uh, how, how San Antonio went through the last downturn and, you know, how it's been growing and um, really just tried to pick a market where I thought we could do really well long term. Um, cause I have a, a, for the first time I have a, have a school age son. And so I wanted to move somewhere where once he started school, I was, I'd be confident in that market, at least for the next 12 years. Um, and so that's how we pick San Antonio. I mean, it, there's some other, you know, personal, um, reasons, but it was, you know, the main reason was it's, it's a, it's a good market, uh, for what I'm trying to do. You know, I, I brought a whole bunch of clients from me from other places. So it's a it's a great market for out of state investing, um, especially in the small multifamily and single family home realm. I mean, you just have, uh, you know, I've sold the tremendous amount of fourplexes to people in California, people from Philly, New York. Uh, it is a it's it's a resilient market. You know, it didn't it didn't boom like how Austin did. But also we're, you know, we're down a tiny bit year over year at this point where, you know, we haven't had a big crash like some of the other more boom markets. And that's what I like about it. I, I, it's very stable. Um, you have, you know, five military bases. You have um, just a very, you know, you can't name one industry that really controls our economy here. And that's, uh, you know, that that makes it very attractive when you have the mindset that I do that, um, you know, I, I don't care. I don't care if it's the be best growth market. I just don't want it to get tanks for, you know, like I, I worked in Houston for a while and I like that market. Um, the pricing to rents are pretty similar there because, you know, we're two of the cheaper um, Texas markets, but it's very, you know, they have a, a much stronger tie to the petrochemical industry, right? Like they really boom when that, you know, when oil prices are up and they, and they have are you know more prone to busts when they are not. Well, you know, you kind of mentioned a little bit about mindset, but before we get ahead of ourselves, I, I kind of want to circle back. You you kind of touched on it. Uh, you you did mention that you were you know you got into real estate, um, you know, before the the two thousand and eight crash around that time frame, mm -hmm. and then you were kind of looking ahead, and you were you know seeing or thought there would be a downturn in the market because like you're saying there was so much growth. Um, and it was kind of just headed in that direction. And you hear all over social media, especially on Twitter, you know, a lot of people trying to compare 2008 to now. Um, can you kind of touch on that? Like, what's your thoughts on that? Do you see any similarities? So I think the feeling is very similar. Like, um, you know, even when I started in, you know, in school in, in 2005, we were already talking about the subprime crisis that was coming you know or like and and how cap rate compression was you know happening and it was it you know was it a a shift a permanent shift or was this cyclical um so there was a lot of discussion then of oh we're gonna have a big downturn um just like we're having now right and so in a certain way that the feeling is similar um but and i think on the commercial side i think it's it's going to be um, you, you know, one of the things that I think a lot of people don't realize is the commercial side went first last time in a, in a lot of markets. And so, um, you know, I was in, in 2007, I was, uh, like I said, doing commercial mortgage brokerage. And, um, I remember, you know, I was new at the time and, uh, in like August of 2007, the CMBS market locked up. Like I had my first term sheets on the table from lenders for clients and all of a sudden they all pulled their deals. They're like, we can't do any of the deals that, you know, that we quoted two days ago. Um, and so, uh, you know, that happened really, that, you know, that was late 2007. It wasn't, you know, the 2008 timeframe where we really were into it in a lot of the residential stuff. Um, 
this, you know, so I think the commercial side is is in danger of a similar situation because their lending didn't change that much, right? They still have a lot of balloon debt, a lot of, you know, um, bridge debt. And, um, but on the, on the residential side, you know, one to four family is so much different. I bought my first property. Um, like I said, just, you know, they let me qualify using income from a summer job. Uh, I got a rebate from, you know, I got money from the lender at closing. I got a rebate from my agent because it was some weird referral program. Uh, so I, you know, when I bought that property, it was a VA loan, but I got a $1,500 cash at closing for a property that I had only put a $100 um, earnest money deposit on. And then uh, my next property I bought using a 80% mortgage and a 20% mortgage. And this was, there was nothing special. I didn't have to work hard to find that. Like those mortgages were everywhere. You could just do an 80, 20. It was, you know, the, the second mortgage at a higher rate, but it was like, again, I mean, I, I, at that point, I, it was my first job after school. I had been, I hadn't even worked there three months, you know, like the qualifying criteria was just so non-existent at the time. Um, and I knew a ton of people that had huge portfolios of single family homes that they bought in, in that same way, all 80, 20 loans, and they were using arms. So they had, uh, you know, teaser rates that would be, you know, you'd be, pay one or 2% interest. And then six months or a year later, I mean, it wasn't even like locked in for five or seven years. It was six months, a year, sometimes two or three. Uh, and, you know, loan officers were just telling everybody, oh, yeah, we'll just keep refinancing you, you know, so you can just keep getting that teaser rate if you refinance every six months or a year. And I knew a lot of people that fell for that, right? Like they thought, hmm, why, why not do that? Uh, the professionals are telling me that that's going to work forever. And um, so I don't see that today, right? I mean, like there are people try to compare like the DSCR loans to the ninja loans of the past, right? Because like now we're not caring about the borrower at all, but DSCR loans, you're putting down 20 or 25% in most cases. And they're actually looking at the property to see is that property gonna produce income? Um, a lot of the people, you know, I don't, I don't think that we had as many, um, investors last time that were uh focused on you know they most most of the investors in the in, that were especially the newbies they were all into flipping right they were they were buying home. i had a friend actually in college who had started buying homes and he would just buy them and as soon as they closed put them back up for sale for more money like it was that crazy in that 2005 six seven time frame um that he wasn't really doing anything i mean he and he sometimes he he was, uh, this is, this will give you an idea about the, the level of sophistication he had. Uh, he had, he bought one property that had an old roof, it was, you know, it was graying um, shingles. He painted that black and put it back up for sale. Like, that's it. He's like, well, it's the curb appeal. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't extend the life or anything. And, and he made money on that deal, you know? So uh, I think that a lot of people comparing it to then don't realize just how crazy the lending was at that time. Um, oh, okay. Before we get to, I, I mean, there's so much points I want to touch on. I'm not okay. sure where I want. No, I mean, there's yeah. so much good stuff there. So I think I want to kind of head down because I know you kind of do a lot of short-term rental um, investing. Um, and you, you did mention the DSCR loan. And, you know, I hear a lot of things, people talking about like the Airbnb bust and whatnot, because, you know, people mm -hmm. were getting properties you know, with the expectation of certain amount of, um, you know, bookings. So how do you, do you see that as being an issue as far as, you know, these people's um, qualifying for these properties based on an expectation of a certain amount of, of revenue? So, um, and you know, I, I, I always say, I hate to be in the picture, but I, I, I always am. So I don't own a lot of short-term rentals. Uh, it's a big part of my business is helping clients um, buy them and our, our company manages them. Um, I haven't ended up, I really wanted to buy more, but it hadn't, it didn't happen because it's been hard to pick them up for clients. And so like every time one that's good comes up, 
I have a client that wants to buy it and I'd always rather just make a sale than, than buy my next one. Uh, most of my money at this point is in private mortgages because it's, uh, it's not competitive with my clients and it's a easy, you know, it's, it's something that's easy to do, but, um, that clarification aside, I mean, I spent a lot of my time analyzing, uh, short-term rentals, looking at our, the portfolio that we manage of them. Um, and you know, it, uh, it's interesting because the business is really new in San Antonio, at least on a professional level. The um, It's only been a legal permitted activity here since January of 2019. Uh, PMI Birdie Properties, the, the brokerage where I work, is it's primarily a uh, management company. And we we actually had our first, you know, first short term rental under management in January 2019. So we were ready for that. We knew it was going to happen and we had one teed up ready to go. Uh, today, I think we manage somewhere around 100 and between 105 and 110. I don't know. We're adding them every, you know, every, every month we were adding quite a few. Um, early on, I had one investor who actually had owned them elsewhere. And, uh, you know, it's one of the great things about being a real estate agent that only works with investors is sometimes I get to learn a lot from clients, right? Like if you're an experienced client in another market and you're coming to San Antonio, uh, I, you know, I learned a lot of how how to look at deals from them, uh, you know, from this one particular client who's bought several here from me. He's very data driven. Um, but that sort of started me off early in uh, 2019. And it became the biggest part of my business over the next, you know, or the last several years. Um, I'm not terribly, you know, very few of my clients actually use DSCR loans for short term rentals because, most of the DSCR lenders were requiring that you, um, the income that they look at were, was as if the property were a long-term rental. And so they look at what it would rent for long-term. There's, there are some lenders now that will look at projected air, you know, air DNA data, um, but most of them weren't. And the types of properties that my clients buy are typically you know, large homes with a pool, you know, a lot of bedrooms, and they're not going to work as a regular rental. And so it doesn't, you know, there's not, uh, the DSCR loans aren't, you know, aren't being used for them. And so um, I'd say a good amount of my clients buy their short-term rentals all cash um, because it's, it's such a heavy cash flow business anyway. You can, especially early on, right, in 2019, 2020, you were getting deals that, you were happy with your cash on cash return, even if you bought all cash. Um, some just use traditional, you know, regular more regular um, like conventional investor mortgages. Um, I have had a couple of clients that bought you, you know, qualifying as a second home loan um, because they were buying here from another market. I'm not terribly worried about those because you can only do one of them in each market, um, and you know they the your DTI gets underwritten as if you're just, you know, with no income uh, being associated with that property. And um, you're, you're coming up with so much good information. Like I, 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 I want to keep heading off in different directions, but like, you know, you're just talking about most of your clients, you know, paid your, you know, they paid cash or they, they qualified at, you know, long-term um, rent expectancy. And, that's what you don't hear on like social media, Twitter, you know, people are kind of like cherry picking data and, and trying to make it like everyone that bought an Airbnb, you know, qualified only off of um, the, the short term rental expectations. And that's why, you know, I find it super helpful talking to people like you, you know, boots on the ground or people that are in this field that can give you an insight on what they're seeing or what their clients deal with. And I also like how you mentioned um, you yourself, you know, is not really too much in the short-term rental, you know, investment, but your clients are. And I talked to another um, like investor, property manager, realtor in in uh, Pennsylvania, and he kind of had the same feeling. He, he felt like I don't buy a lot of investment properties anymore because my clients are buying all the good deals. And that's like his number one duty is to, bring these deals to his clients. So pretty much he's only left with the leftovers a lot of times. And right. so, yeah, so I, I love that. And that's kind of what I'm trying to find the balance to as, as a new realtor in, in Hawaii is trying to find that balance of, uh, you know, your clients, um, 
needs first before yourself as an investor. Um, you know, one other thing I, I wanted to touch on is you kind of touched on you, you know, you guys started in 2019, the short term rental. So I believe COVID was 2020, right? The, the start mm-hmm. of it. So did that kind of throw things in a wrench for you folks? Or how did that impact you folks? It certainly did. So um, and, and I actually uh, I want to get back to one other thing that, that you oh, mentioned sure, sure. Um, about, um, you know, uh, not buy. So I, I want to just mention a mistake that I made, but may, I, I, uh, as far as um, one of the things I was trying to do to not be competitive with clients is to build my own short term rentals. Um, I started building a shipping container home uh, two, over two years ago now and just <laughs> just got the CEO last week. Um, and so, you know, I, I was all in and I, I still am on that idea on the business model. It, it, it really is just uh, and I thought I was going to have that up and running a long time ago and just keep building these. It turns out that I am not cut out to be uh, a home builder, especially not something that's uh, such a weird project. But, but there's, I there's, a, there's a place that people can kind of find that journey, right? Right. Yes. Yeah. I have a I have some YouTube videos about that. Um, you know, if you just search my name, you'll, you'll find me on YouTube, but, uh, you know, that probably one of my biggest, not probably one of my biggest errors in real estate was, was that project. And it's, it, you know, um, but, uh, yeah, there's, 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 a, I've, I've talked a lot about that. It is definitely a, a public blunder. Um, I am just about done with it now, but, uh, you know, so it is, I've, I've definitely, and I did that deal all cash, uh, you know, and it ended up being, more than double my initial budget. Um, and so that was a lot of that was what I had uh, that would have been, that is what I had allocated for my short-term rental investing budget. Um, and so, you know, I had a, a deal with my wife that I wasn't gonna buy another short-term rental until that was done. So that really that really uh, gave me problems over the last couple of years. Um, but yeah, as far as uh, the, you know, how, what happened during COVID, um, by that time, I think we were managing about 25 short-term rentals. Um, we might not have even been had that many live yet, but we were, we, you know, it, it wasn't too far in, right? Yeah, we were a year in. Um, I'm pretty sure we picked up 25 the first year, though. Uh, some Somewhere close to that number is, is sticking in my head. Um, you know, March and April was terrifying. Uh, by May, our property, every property that we had had for you know, the whole time it was killing it. I mean, it was, it was a matter of, uh, you know, because all, you know, all of a sudden we had all these local stays from people who, you know, were working from home and lived in a one bedroom apartment or studio and working from home wasn't working for them. Um, so that it actually, I think created a, a boom in stays here. And we're also very much, you know, uh, San Antonio is a really interesting, um, market for short-term rentals because, you know, we're a driving market, right? Like, you know, we're, people come from all over Texas to, you know, we're not, we obviously we have an airport and we get plenty of guests that way too. But um, at a time when no one was flying, this became more of a destination than maybe we would have been otherwise. And so we, you know, 2020 actually ended up being a, a pretty great year for San Antonio for short-term rentals, especially the stuff that we had that, you know, the bigger properties with the pools, people that wanted more space, maybe even locally. Um, the stuff that we have on the outskirts of town did really well. Uh, so, um, yeah, you know, it, it, it was terrifying for about a month, right? And it, the other thing that it really killed is, at the time we were doing all the setup for clients for their short-term rentals, like buying all the furniture, um, doing basically everything. Now, now, you know, we have a third party that sort of partners with us um, or the clients do it. Some of the clients just like to do it and they do it themselves. Um, and so it really slowed down, um, you know, cause we're usually doing pretty high end furniture and decor. And, uh, you know, I remember one, we were waiting for this custom table that was supposed to be in in two weeks, and then it was four weeks, and then it was three or four months. And, you know, but because we kept thinking we were going to get it any minute now, we didn't go live and just throw some other table in that in that one. Um, so we had some that just kept 
you know, that really delayed their going live. Um, but it, you know, I honestly think it, it act, you know, the net benefit, you know, financially just for, you know, obviously not for overall, but for financially for Airbnbs, uh, that, you know, it, it just really moved us forward. Like it, it was, it was, you know, everybody that had one that was operating did awesome that year. Um, the next year was also a really great year. Um, you know, we have a, uh, we have some limits on how, how fat or how they can grow because we have density requirements in our permitting rules. So like, um, if you have a permit, another home with it, this is a rough approximation of how the, the rule works. So don't, don't, don't like use this rule and try to think you can go out and get a permit. But if you have a permit, basically, if there's a, if, if there's a home within eight homes of either side of yours that has a permit, you're not going to get one because they don't want whole neighborhoods turning into it. They don't want it to be too dense. Um, and yeah, so, you know, I didn't think Texas had rules. Yeah. So the yeah. wild, wild west. Over yeah. There. Well, it's a San Antonio <laughs> rule, right? The, the cities have their own rules. Um, <laughs> Houston is a lot more fun when it comes to certain things. You know, I, I don't I actually don't know what their short term rental stuff is, but you know, they're famous for having no zoning and, um, but no, we, we, we have some rules. They're just, uh, <laughs> I actually really like this one, right? Um, it is, oh, yeah. uh, you know, it it gives you when you buy a home and you have one operating, you know, there's your neighbor's not going to open one up, right? I mean, so there is, um, it's it's a little bit of protection, but it also has made it so certain parts of town that uh, you can't even buy one anymore because there's so many permits there. It's it's basically you know you're locked out. I mean, it's so. Um, so it's, you know, I think that the growth of SDRs here is a little bit slower than in some places because a lot of the obvious spots are are pretty saturated, it, you know, saturated according to our rule, but like in a different city where that was allowed, you'd have 10 times as many in those neighborhoods. Um, is, there a, is there a heavy, like the permit, is there a high fee for that? Not at all. It's uh, the last time I checked, and I'm I'm not the one who's usually doing it, but it's a hundred dollar fee. I think you you renew it every year. Um, it's very simple to qualify. You know, you have to submit a floor plan that shows like where the bedrooms and the egress is, and uh, I mean that's really you know you have to show that it, that there's not another permit too close to you. And if you meet those those guidelines, uh, you you know you show them that there's enough parking. But that's rule has. Is sort of amorphous. Um, is, is, it, yeah, can it's someone e like process. can someone like pretty much have that permit forever? Like so, no one else can. You so know. you 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 get. It's, I think I said renew it annually, but you get a three year permit. Um, and then so far there seems like there's no limitation on us renewing those as long as uh we keep them renewed. And so yeah, it it seems like. And like I said, I mean, this rule has only been around since 2019. They've tweaked it a little bit since then, at least the way that they administer it. Um, but it seems to be that once you have that permit, as long as you maintain it, you're not going to lose it unless they change the rules. Well, I was, I was wondering more like, like, what if, you know, is there a way to like, you know, you, you know, it has to rotate or, or everyone else, you know, has an option to, to if they wanted to do short term rental, like hey, say you know you have it for three years, and now like you're saying, someone else could possibly apply for the permit. Or no, is it like it, oh, okay. No, it's I mean it's you have it the the it doesn't transfer with the property. So when you sell, the next owner has to apply. But as long as they do that before somebody else in the street that would block them applies, I mean they're they're going to get it. And so it is it created a bit of a land grab here, right? Like people just wanted to get out there and get a permit. A lot of homeowners or people that had just regular investment properties applied for permits for their units just to make sure they'd have it in the future. Um, you know, if, you, if you're somebody who owns properties in San Antonio and you can do that, it's, a, it's a, something I would just do. I mean, it costs you a hundred bucks and renew it every three years. And um, then you always have that option. One, one nuance to the rule is that's only for what they call type two permits, which is you own a pure investment property. You don't live there and you're using it on Airbnb. Anybody, if they have a home that's their primary residence, you you can have as many, but like you move out on the weekends or something, or you rent a space in that home. Those permits are what the city calls type one permits. And there's no density 
um, restriction there. So you could have one. So one of those could open up right next to your type two, but um, which I think makes sense, right? I mean, if yeah. you're living in the home and you're using it, it's, it's not the same as somebody like running a whole street as a, as a hotel. So. That is exact. I was just talking to another realtor the other day. I was telling you, cause Hawaii has very strict regulations. And I was saying they should at least allow people if they're living on that property and residing there, they can still, you know, short-term rent to a room or, or something on their property if they're residing there. But yeah, it makes so much sense, but I guess, you know, that's why there's not, not to get political and stuff. That's why there's Texas and, you know, Hawaii and whatnot, but, but um, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely going to off camera. I want to touch base on some short-term rental stuff also, but there is, you know, something that, you know, you, like you saying, you, you always like to talk about the downside mm -hmm. and, and I, I love that. And so, you know, all over social media, it, you know, people are trying to make like real estate is an easy game. It's easy to get into it. It's so passive and you kind of touched on it a little bit. I want to kind of circle back to that, but you're talking about uh, people that you knew, you know, investing, uh, you know, around 2005, 2008 uh, with all these adjustable rate mortgages are those people still in the business investing or, or how did that, how did their property or portfolio um, look like now, or do they still have it? So I, I know a lot of people that got out of the business in 2008 timeframe um, went bankrupt or just lost a lot of properties and never got back into investing. Um, I think that was, there were probably more people like that, at least that I knew, uh, then um and even like on the commercial side where i you know where i was an employee and knew a lot of uh people in the industry as employees a lot of them just got out you know went to regular finance and whatnot and so no i mean a, lo a lot of the people just got out completely and are now doing you know wh whatever other job that they either went back to school i knew a lot of people that went back to school did different things um and it's one of the things i know we've talked about this a little bit but i, I really believe uh, you know, if you stay in real estate long enough, you're going to end up wealthy. But so, and that's why I'm always talking about the downside is the trick is making sure you survive until that point long enough. Right. And I think that, um, the, you know, I, I knew, well, one, I mean, I, I didn't have a ton of properties yet. Um, but I had, a, a you know, I had always bought, um, even though I had very high leverage. I had bought properties for cash flow at the time. Uh, well, not really cash flow because you know I bought ones that were really neutral. But I bought properties that at least were self sustaining, right? And that um, I was able to operate and you know keep them long enough. Uh, and, and even some of them, like I bought the, the one, the first one I bought in two thousand five. Uh, was a duplex that I sold in 2009, even though I had put a zero down and sold it for a decent profit. And so, um, but I think, you know, I, I was doing that because I was liquidating uh, properties a little bit because my, uh, my commercial mortgage income had dried up, right? So my, my W-2 income. And so that time period for me was extremely difficult um, because my, you know, I made the mistake of going to a, a completely commission-based job at a, at the very worst time. You know, I, I switched to that in the middle of 2007. Um, and, you know, the company that I was in in 2008 made 10% of the revenue that they made in 2007 on uh, mortgage origination. So you can imagine as a new person in that, you know, that I, I did terrible as well. Um, but so, you know, I really saw the people who made it through the business and the people who didn't. And, and one of the things that I think um, really stuck with me uh, and it actually, you know, it took me a long time to really be able to put it into um, words. And I, I don't know if you uh, are familiar with um, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. He wrote, uh, you know, Black Swan, Fooled by Randomness, Anti-Fragile. I'm a huge fan of all his stuff and, you know, have read his books a bunch of times. But he really, um, he talks about like, you know, the basically like the wisdom of old people, sort of like the heuristics the you know, that that when you come when you hold that up against like the theory of finance, 
um, and probability and statistics that a lot of times what we think is the right move. And, you know, I was, I was classically trained in real estate finance. Right. And so, uh, I was all about max leverage and, uh, you know, running numbers and the people that you saw that really just did amazing during that da downturn were the opposite of that, right? Like they were people that were cash heavy that hadn't been super levered going into that time period who had um, just like a robust portfolio that was just never going to die, right? Like they just had, um, you know, either strong cash flow or they had some strong outside income that they could support their properties with. And so those people just did amazingly well. I mean, I saw some just you know, really unbelievable deals that like, have you you know, in, in 2008, when there was max panic, right, it wasn't the bottom of the market yet, but it was the height of people panicking. Um, you know, people that had a big chunk of cash and were willing to step in at that time, because they could deploy it with no fear, because they knew how strong their portfolio was. Um, I, I saw deals, you know, a couple that, that transacted during that time frame that you know, we're so much better even than what happened, you know, even than by the time the market bottomed. Um, I think I'm probably not really addressing your question as far as, uh, like I said, I mean, I, I really just, you know, going off on a tangent there. But No, um, I, I love it. That's exactly kind of, you know, you brought it up. I was kind of trying to lead you into like the tweet that we talked about, how, how you're saying it's, it's important to, you know, real estate is staying in the game long right. enough. Like if you hold it long enough, you know, you, you know, most people, you're going to be successful for the most part. And I think that's yeah. kind of what's frustrating on social media sometimes is, you know, everybody's talking about Airbnb arbitrage, multifamily, right. fix and flip, and they're making it seem like it's so easy when like, you just kind of touched on it. It's kind of that, you know, stack cash, but also, you know, buy and hold, you know, long-term vision. And in the end, you know, you, you know, you should be pretty successful at it. Right. And, and that's it. Yeah. And I, I think it's a great point. And it's really it is something that frustrates me. I think our industry has way too many of these people that are, you know, just really trying to puff up the industry. There's a lot of people that, in positions like we have, right, as, as uh, real estate salespeople that they just own, they never want to say a bad word about real estate because they they want you to buy it. Right. And, um, you know, one thing that I've learned is that if I, you know, a client comes to me and I tell them why they shouldn't buy a property, that's going to be a loyal client forever, right? Like, I mean, it, it might take me an extra six months to find them their first deal because I've now clued them into some of the things that they should not buy. But, you know, if you sell them a bad deal, you might never get a second deal from them. But, you know, more than half of my business comes from repeat business from clients that have bought something from me, we manage it, it's successful, and they're going on to buy more. And if you're, um, you know, if you're just trying to make that quick sale, because, you know, real estate never goes down, and, um, you know, your your rents are going to grow forever, well, then you're, you know, you might make money more than me in the short run, but it's it's not, you know, I don't think that's a good business model, I think, but it's where what you see a lot of people deploy. Um, and they just have everybody that's selling a course or selling, you know, some sort of coaching product or um, that is also, you know, really those only sell for big money if it's going to make you rich quick. Right. Like, I mean, there's um, there are no new ideas in real estate. I, you know, Airbnb arbitrage is probably the only thing I can think of that. Uh, so, you know, I, I talked about when I first started, you know, thinking about money. Uh, when I was in college and reading a lot of books, I mean, I, you know, I, I went to Barnes and Nobles, you know, every weekend and bought multiple books on, on investing and real estate and that sort of thing. One of the things I bought at that point in time was this, uh, a late night infomercial course on, uh, on, um, VHS and, you know, there was VHS and cassette tapes and it was a uh, Carlton sheets, no money down program. And he literally, he talks about, you know, uh, owner financing, subject to deals, wrap mortgages, wholesaling, like they're literally everything that people like try to package as a course today. We're all in his one course, right? Like there's just really no secrets. There's nothing new. These are all ideas that have been out there for a while. Um, 
But in order for people to to sell a course on it, you know, they have to puff it up and and be like, no, you can you can buy a hundred units this year. And the truth is, you can buy a hundred units this year, right? Like you could go if you have the right level of hustle. Um, but you're going to have a portfolio that is very fragile, right? Like those were the people, those types of portfolios didn't make it last time and probably won't again. Like if you were, um, and some will, you know, there's going to be outliers, right? And and that's what sort of they count on. Like, I think if you think, if you look at like a lot of the big podcasts, they continually bring on guests that have had, you know, unbelievable success. And they want to, you know, and it's like, they all like want to deny that there's any luck involved, right? It's like, no, no, if you do these steps and it's hard work. Um, but what they ignore is that they have hundreds of thousands of people tuning into their podcast. Tons of those people are out there doing the same things. And for many of them, it's getting them in trouble, right? Like you have to have, uh, it's basically there's a survivorship bias, right? Like you're seeing, you're only seeing the successful ones because people don't, people don't want to go on the podcast and tell you I failed at this. And those podcasters don't want to, you know, bring you on there. Right. And so, um, you get a very one-sided view and it's what's I think is really funny is e even some of the, you know, like even some of the bigger ones have had guests on that they were just duped by, right? Like these were people that were just completely lying about their portfolios and their, you know, their, um, performance and like, you know, and uh, the, you know, the biggest real estate podcast had one guy on twice, right. That was, that later turned out to be a, uh, um, just a total scammer, like didn't own anything. And it was just selling courses and like lying about what he owned. Um, so th there's a lot of that in our business. Uh, I got really clued into it and that, you know, I think we'll see more of that come out uh, because in, so I already mentioned this a little bit, a, a company I worked for in um, 2007, uh, I left three months before the FBI raided them. And uh, they, there's now an American Greed episode about them uh, that uh, they, were, uh, they were really successful in funding mortgages, but they were you know, really tough commercial mortgages and like for like hotels and things that nobody else would finance, but they were making way more money telling people, yes, we can fund that, taking a huge uh, non-refundable, you know, processing fee or deposit or whatever they would call it. Um, this would happen, uh, you know, they would do that. And uh, so, yeah, it, you know, they seemed unbelievably successful until it turned out, well, they weren't actually closing any of those loans. I mean, they were the the numbers that we were closing and I worked on the side, they had basically had a separate, so we didn't realize what was happening on the other side. Um, but once I figured it out, it's why I left there. Um, but so that would, you know, they were like um, getting all sorts of press about being this great company. And uh, it turned out, you know, yeah, I mean, the, the founder went to jail and I, I think one other person there. Um, and I, I knew another lady who was out at the local REIA, you know, at the associate, the real estate investor association meetings, almost every month she'd be there either teaching a class or selling her course on raising private money. Um, and the, I went, I went to one of her things and I, I wasn't, I hadn't even gone to law school yet. And I realized just from her initial pitch that there's no way what she was doing was legal. Um, you know, and it turned out, you know, in 2009, she got investigated by the SEC for doing exactly what she was teaching a course on, right? I mean, and ended up in jail also, right? Like, and so when everything's going well, nobody's complaining, she's making money doing this thing that really shouldn't be doing. Um, you know, and, and there's just so much of that, you know, either these people uh, you know, and in everybody's mind, she was one of the most successful people that went to our investor group. You know, I mean, she was, you know, everybody wanted to, I knew tons of people that paid for her course and was trying to do her strategy. And um, so it is, I mean, there's, it's a lot of times the strategies that are, make it easy to grow fast are either, they might just be completely illegal, but people, you know, maybe it's legal. Well, what she was doing was an SEC thing. So it wasn't really legal anywhere. 
Um, but, you know, some of the stuff might work in some states because state real estate law changes vastly from one state to the next. And, uh, you know, and they'll just say, be like, oh, I did two deals like this. It worked for me. Let me put a course together. And, um, you know, the, the one that drives me really crazy is they'll be like, and, you know, with my course, you get my documents that are legal in all 50 states. Like you hear people say that regularly. And there's just like, I mean, the owning that paper might not be illegal, but like, you know, using it to, to do a deal makes zero sense in some states based on the, you know, the, the differences and the nuance in the law. Um, so there is just, a, Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, you need to bring your YouTube channel back so that you can be <laughs> helping the, the, the newbie and the, the smaller person trying to get started. Who's on the fence, but you got to, but if not, like I, like I keep telling you, you got to follow you on Twitter you yeah, know, putting great content, and you, like I said, you're 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 trying to tell people it's not that easy. You know, it it is there's there's work to be involved, but in the long run, but yeah, your your information it, and is it's great. true, yeah, right. I mean, it's true. Like, and and I sometimes I think I get caught too, caught up too much in telling you about the negatives because I just think the positives are assumed. Right. I have a bunch of clients that have bought, you know, single family homes, duplexes, fourplexes, even, you know, some, some larger multifamily um, that bought them well, you know, used a large down payment, maybe even bought in cash, but, you know, you don't have to buy in cash, but you have to buy in a way that, you know, you have significant, um, you know, an ability to, to live through some missed mortgage payments. And one of the best ways to do that is to just have a strong outside income too, right? And relative to the size of your portfolio. Um, and, uh, you know, and that have done incredibly well. I mean, I have, uh, some that within two or three years have been able to match or, you know, or, uh, surpass their active income, uh, with their real estate portfolios, but it is, uh, it need. I think it needs to be done in a way that is really with a mind towards just surviving because like, I mean, like, you know, um, I mentioned, I've never been a big you know, a huge proponent of buying. Well, early on, I was really into cash flow, but somewhere relatively early, I realized that all of the money that I've made in real estate, like oh, four or five to one, has been on properties appreciating. And that's even true of properties. The, the one I mentioned, I bought in 2005 and sold, um, you know, in 2009. Like that one, the the profit I made on that was more than all the cash flow in between. Um, but that's been true on almost every property that I've ever owned. Uh, and it's, um, you know, the reason is I've, I've made a switch to buying premium assets, right? Like, I, and I think that's one thing that's missed a lot. A lot of people are just looking at that cash flow number and it drives them into riskier properties. They're either in a market that's risky, maybe they're buying somewhere that has a declining population which I think is just absolutely absurd. Like I, you know, th th there's a lot of people pushing into, you know, people into markets that are heavy cash flow, but it, you know, the actual, like if you look at the demographics, it's clear that their property values have to eventually come down. Um, and, you know, maybe it's, if you go into it and you understand that and you're like, uh, you know, you're kind of doing Warren Buffett's cigar butt method, you know, where you're buying something and you get real, you know, you're getting a couple good puffs out of it, but before the asset value goes away like that, that's a legitimate strategy. But most of the time, the people that are buying those don't understand that that's the strategy they're employing, right? Like they're looking at it as this is a long-term deal and don't understand that, uh, that that's going to be an issue but um but so that you know the one is uh the opposite of that is which what i think is makes a lot of sense is buying in fast growing markets um or st really steady growth i mean i picked san antonio it wasn't the fastest growing market but it is one of the steadiest growth markets over a very long period of time um and sort of predictable the directions of growth uh you know what what places are doing well and so you know in general, finding a market like that, I think is, you know, a lot of people would say, well, that's a, those are riskier because you don't have as much cash flow. But on the flip side, uh, you have better fundamentals, right, that are supporting your property. And so I, 
yeah, okay, maybe the cash flow is lower. Put more down so that you have a better cash flow, but you're going to have a better asset in the long run. It's sort of like, um, you know, if you, the, the people that focus just on cash flow, if you think about investing in stocks, that's like, I'm just buying the highest dividend yield, right? And like, if you look at stocks that have a 10% dividend yield, pretty much they're not good stocks, right? Like, I mean, like, usually it means there's something wrong. And everybody knows that in the stock market, that these really high yields are an indication of risk or something wrong. But on the on the real estate side, you have a lot of the people pushing that that strategy, not understanding that those assets are priced a certain way because they're riskier assets. Um, and so, you know, this, uh, so my mindset is right, you know, pick a market that is a robust growing market that has a diversified economy. And then in that market, buy the nicest properties that you can, right? Like it's not, a, a, and then arrange your financing in such a way that it's still a positive cash flow, right? It's okay, you know, right? Yeah, no, I was, I was going to just ask for your clarification on that, that you're not advising or no, ad, not advising anything here, but you're not saying to purchase something that has a negative cash flow, even no. though you expect to appreciate. Okay. Just one. Right. Okay. Right. No, no. I, I mean, I would, uh, I've bought some bro break even properties at times where I knew that I, you know, one, I had cash reserves and two, I knew, you know, I could support it if something happened, but no, I, I don't think it makes any sense to buy something that loses money every month. Um, but I do think it makes sense to bring more cash to the table to be able to buy a more premium asset. Um, and I think in the long run, whenever I've bought nicer properties, my returns have been better. Uh, they just have because, you know, uh, they just tend to appreciate more. You know, you have it's and so one of the things a lot of people talk about, you know, banking on appreciation is risky and cash flow is certain. And I think that that is one, I think cash flow is not any more certain than appreciation because uh, rents can go down, expenses can go up, you can have eviction moratoriums, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things that can attack your cash flow, just like your appreciation. But the other thing is, I think it's very easy, or it's not very easy, but it is, um, it's, you know, I, I think you can predict relative appreciation um, just as easy as you can predict cash flow. And when I mean relative appreciation, I mean, if I'm comparing two properties, which one is going to do better? If I'm comparing two markets, which one is going to do better on average in the long run, right? Like, um, so, you know, and the reason is, is because you're looking at the fundamentals, just like when you, you know, if you're analyzing a stock, you're going to look at the business fundamentals, not just the numbers today, right? Like what's the supply and demand for whatever product they're selling? And that's that's the same approach I take looking at real estate, right? Like, uh, so you know, good schools is an important thing for me. Uh, I have, and this was one of the things that I was really ignorant. You know, a lot of a lot of this uh, is stuff that I picked up from some of my older, really successful investors um, that have been doing things for a long. You know, so one of them was one of the early on ones. They it was uh, they were trying to buy. It was a partnership and they they were buying only in um, not the very best school district because there's a risk there of it getting bumped off. And like the very best schools typically have a premium. And so if they get passed up, you lose that premium. But so uh, but in the top, you know, second, third or fourth best schools assigned to to a home in an area. Um, and it had a lot of other criteria that, you know, about the property itself, about the size of it. Um, and at first, you know, when I when I first started working with them, I was very much still in a, you know, just looking at cash flow. And I'd be like, why would you buy this? I've got these properties over here. You're going to make a lot more money. And they're like, no, 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 no. The, you know, this is what we're doing. And, uh, you know, over the last five years, they did so much better on those properties than the stuff that I, you know, that I thought they should buy. Right. And so, uh, you know, even, even as, and it really was in, in 2018 that I had that, you know, so even that far into my career, I still didn't fully grasp how important it is to buy, you know, to just get those quality assets. Right. And so, um, and it should have, you know, I, I feel like that this lesson has been like, 
you know, has hit me in the face a bunch of times over the last 18 years. Um, but it, you know, it's tough to reprogram past all of the noise that you hear, you know, like at any time I say that, you know, what basically what I'm saying here, there's just so much pushback from the, you know, oh, well, you need that cash flow to be able to snowball. But it's like, it's it's not true. Like all of my big snowballs have come from liquidity events, either a refinance or a sale of a property. Um, and it's not even close, right? Like, I mean, usually when, when I've taken some profits from, you know, from an investment property, it's been, like I said, like four or five times if I added up all the cash flow from my holding period, it, you know, and and that's how almost everybody that I've seen grow a, a big portfolio in one that I think is a robust, like strong, self-sustaining portfolio has done it through appreciation and a lot of times forced appreciation, right? Like doing some value add, but then also mostly with a lot of outside income that they're willing to continue to put into it, right? Like um, real estate investing is investing, right? And you wouldn't be a stock investor and have bought one stock and expect to never put more money in, right? Like people that invest in stocks, they put money in every month. Uh, people that invest in real estate expect to take money out every month and and then don't understand why their portfolio doesn't grow, right? Like um, and so, you know, I think it's important to have, and that's why even though at this point, you know, I have not, you know, I don't have a huge portfolio, but I, I have, uh, you know, some outside income that I'm, I'm pretty happy with. I'm going to be an agent probably forever, right? Like one, it's fun. Helping other people get into real estate is a lot of fun. But the other is, it's nice to just keep having these chunks of, of income to be able to, you know, I, I don't, I don't own anything nice. I mean, you can probably tell from just the pictures I post online. Like I, you know, I'm not, I don't buy nice anything. I think I have a, my trucker hat needs to be replaced here. Right. <laughs> but, um, uh, but what I uh, really just addicted to like putting more money into that next land deal or the next, you know, and it's, uh, it's something that's, I think one big mistake that people do too soon too, is like they try to go all in on real estate investing when they don't have the capital to invest. And then they have to scramble and raise money from people, which is fine. I mean, I know syndicators that have done very well, but I also know syndicators that have gotten themselves in a lot of trouble because they don't have a, a deep pool of assets to pull from the first time they get in trouble. And so um, this is something I saw. Uh, I know one guy who did really well in 2009, 10, 11. Um, he had been an LP in a number of syndications, but he had a significant income. And so when capital calls happened and people came to him and said, hey, you know, our property's not performing, we need some more money. He said, you know, and a lot of the LPs out there were like, no, we're not putting more money into this. He basically said, I'm going to fund it, but now I'm going to own the majority of the GP. Right. And he did that. Uh, I mean, I think that's basic. I mean, he's really successful now. And I'm pretty sure that's how he built his whole portfolio was from, uh, you know, over levered and under undercapitalized syndicators that he had invested in. That when they, you know, when they came back to him, he's like, okay, clearly you don't know what you're doing and I've got the money and I, you know, and, and so he bailed them out, but at the same time, just, you know, took over their businesses basically. Um, I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that, but, uh, you know, I think that uh, having that, you know, the reason he could do that was because he ha he didn't have every last dollar in a deal and he did, he still had his other business where he was making money. So he at a time when, you know, his properties weren't, he would, you know, he had the money to, to step in with. And so um, I think if you, if people looked at my, you know, financial position, especially like the typical, you know, real estate maxi type person who's like, you just have to buy, you know, be fully, they, they would just like really laugh at my lack of leverage, like ridiculous lack of leverage at the moment. Um but oh, uh, do you do you do you follow um, like Dion McNeely on YouTube? Dion Financial Talk, by any chance? Um, it, you know, I think I've seen him. Is he he goes on the uh, One Rental at a Time yes, podcast yeah. sometimes? Yeah, I've yeah. seen him on there. I don't I don't know that I follow his actual okay. channel. I think his strategy is a lot like like what you're just talking about. Like not 
not everyone wants to be leveraged. They just, like you're saying, you, you know, he has a lot of equity and properties. That's why they cash flow very well. You right. know, he's comfortable with a certain number of properties. He's not trying to get to a hundred units. He, you know, so everyone has a different strategy. And I, and I like right. what you're saying, like, you know, it's, it's your comfort level and you don't have to be leveraged up to, to do well in this, in this game. But I kind of want to transition real quick to, um, uh, shoot, I just lost my train of thought. Well, um, oh yeah, not advice here, but if you were starting over today, like how would you get your foot in the door as an investor or get, you know, how would you enter this real estate market or real estate game? The, the first thing, and this is something I would do different is I would keep my, I had a, you know, a solid W2 job and I switched to a commission only job in real estate too early. And so it really messed me up by being able to qualify for mortgages. And so I'd say, you know, the main thing I'd want to make sure that I had my W-2 income locked down and that I have done everything I possibly can to maximize that income, right? Like, I think as much as I want everyone to own real estate, I don't want you to do it if, you know, you're working uh, a job that is way below your skill level and you could be earning double or triple first. I Like, I think figuring that part out first is really important. And the clients that I have that have done very well have usually started in that spot, right? Um, but then as far as getting into the market today, it's a scary time, right? I mean, there's uh, there's a lot of people that think prices are going to come down. I don't necessarily think there's going to be any big dip in my market, but I think that it's unlikely we're going to get, you know, in the near term, get a lot of appreciation here. And so um, I'm going to let that temper my excitement about buying stuff. I'm going to buy... It, the nicest property in the nicest part of town that I can. Um, I want to, you know, I want to have a, a significant cash reserve and, uh, um, you know, and if it's one thing, if it's a single family home, you know, maybe you don't have, an, you know, a lot of people get excited about real estate and don't even have a down payment for one single family home. Right. And uh, that's fine. I think if you're in that situation and you have good income, the first thing I'd, I'd recommend is house hacking, right? I mean, I think like buying a property, either either buying a single family home that has a lot of rooms and renting out those rooms, buying a single family home that has a small spot that you can live in and using the rest of it for Airbnb. Uh, one of the, one of my clients, I, I think she did an amazing job. She bought a very large single family home because she had a, very, a really strong income. Uh, and she basically lives in there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, spends a long weekend with family and friends every time and rents it out on Airbnb. It's close to downtown. And those are the days that they're on, you know, your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday aren't big days anyway, right? Uh, for a short-term rental. And so she's almost making as much as you would on just a regular short-term rental. Um, it works well with our licensing or permitting law here, right? Because it's it's a it's her primary residence, so she can do this anywhere. Uh, but that's one of the more interesting house hacks, right? It's it's yeah. in, instead of splitting up the house, she's splitting up the time she spends in the house, and then she she got to go nuts spending on her furnishings and decor because you know she's getting a good return on that. So yeah. that's a strategy. Um, buying you know buying a duplex like my first property was a duplex and renting out the other side. I mean. You know, I, I would I strongly recommend that for clients is um, is if you can afford to buy something in the market that you live in, uh, that's the first thing I always want to do. I always want a house hack, but you know, I want to make sure that your income is comfortably qualified for that property, right? Like, I don't if you need those roommates to make those, you know, to make your payments. That's a that's too risky for me, right? Like I want you to be able to qualify and pay for that mortgage by yourself, and then the roommates that you bring in, or the tenants on the other side, or your STR income, is extra money that then you can start saving up and deploy for your next deal. So that's you know that I mean house hacking I think is the most obvious first thing. Um, then I mean buying you know single family properties, uh, you know with this with a significant down payment I think makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, some of the other things that I've done that I think are, you know, would be interesting for people, uh, you know, buying small uh, lots. 
Uh, and this is something that I've only done for a couple of years. And so I haven't gone through a whole cycle, but so far I, I like it. And I've seen, I actually uh, know somebody who built a very large business doing this. And so I, I feel pretty comfortable telling clients about it, although it's not something, you know, I always, uh, when I recommend it, um, give them a lot of, a lot of these disclaimers like I'm doing now. But so buying, you know, buying a lot here in town and then sell, you know, turn around and selling it on owner financing instantly. Um, I find you can get a nice premium from by financing it and you get a good interest rate. And so here, you know, here in San Antonio, uh, you know, I've bought lots for as cheap as 12,000. Uh, I think I got one for 11,000 actually. Um, you know, and you put some money in to getting some renderings for the property or, you, you know, in, in cleaning it up. Um, and then, you know, you can set, you can get really great returns doing that with very small sums of money. And I, I mentioned the 11,000 when that was a few years ago, probably if you were going to do that, you, you might, you might be able to get lots today for 25 or 30,000, but it, it's a, it's a pretty small relative to what you need for a down payment for a single family home. Um, it's a strategy I like a lot. I think, you know, an, another thing that I might just do if I, if I were going to get started today is, you know, uh, find someone who's doing a, you know, either a really successful flipper, um, or someone who's, you know, uh, just more experienced than me. And that's something I didn't, I didn't do enough of early on is like try to partner with more experienced people. I did it a little bit, but not nearly as much as I should have. Um, and just let, you know, see, see if I can put my money in their deals. Right. And see, uh, there's nothing wrong with being an LP, or being a minority partner in a, you know, um, or even being, um, I've really gotten into private lending. I think that that's, it's something that more people should do if they really, you know, if they have a, if you have a, a W2 that's, you know, that's keeping you really busy, um, it's a way to deploy capital at, at you know, pretty high rates of interest um, and learn about deals, right? Like if you're, if you're lending on people's deals who are doing, you um, you know, uh, the types of deals that you hope to do in the future. Um, it's, it's a way to get paid on those and also, you know, have the right to be involved and ask a lot of questions. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. And so maybe that's just funding the construction portion of somebody's, you know, maybe they buy it and then you're, you're funding construction. Maybe, you know, there's, I think there's a lot of ways to get involved without just going all in. Um, you know, obviously the house hacking is nice because you're putting very little down. Um, I do like, you know, I've had some clients that use the second home loan to do an STR in another market. I'm sort of on the fence about that because you can put a small amount down. Um, you know, obviously, I don't think it's a good idea to manage it yourself from afar. So you need to have a market where you really trust the STR manager um, and ideally have a second good option for STR managers in that area. Right. Because. uh you don't want to be completely stuck with whoever you're picking. Um, and then, you know, be able to cover that mortgage payment in months when you make nothing, right? But part of why I'm okay with the high leverage of the second home loan is because they are underwriting your income only, you know. So, um, you know, the the risk is being offset in a different way than, than it is, you know, the, the, the lender is making sure that you actually can afford it as, as a luxury item. And then you turn it into an income producing asset. I love the, the not advice that you're giving. This is super helpful for people to get started, figure out how to get into this real estate investing or get into real estate in general. Um, but before I let you go, I know this has been amazing. I, I kind of want to give you a little bit of time for a selfless promotion. Like where can people find you? Uh, where's your social media content at, but how can people reach out to you? So um, the easiest way to actually contact me is to go to my website, which is birdieinvestmentteam.com. So B I R D Y investmentteam.com. Um, that that's the easiest way to actually just contact me. But uh, the only social media I'm really active on is Twitter. Um, my handle there is at J Ketchapalia. Uh, that's J C A C C I A P A G L I A. Uh, and then, you know, my, I use my name in all social media. So I, even though I usually say Joe, I always spell it out Joseph Ketchapalia. And so you can find me on Facebook, LinkedIn, 
uh, my YouTube channel is that name. Um, Twitter, Twitter is really where I spend most of my time now. I am on Bigger Pockets. Uh, I don't check those messages nearly enough because it actually just became sort of overwhelming. Um, it's a bit, it's a busy platform. But yeah, any of those. And uh, so you can probably tell I love talking about real estate. Even if you have an asset that you're looking at in other states, I mean, I, I, I take calls from people all the time and, and, you know, I won't, I won't give you real advice, but I'll you other than sometimes uh, what questions, you know, you, you should be asking whoever you're working with if you're in another market. But yeah, if you're looking in San Antonio or the surrounding areas, um, really happy to help you looking at STRs, you know, small multifamily up to, you know, I, I haven't done anything bigger than like 25 or 30 units in a long time, but so, you know, small multifamily. Um, and then, uh, you know, land deals. I, I got pretty into land here too. Um, but yeah, ha happy to help with any of that. Uh, awesome. And, I'll, or I'll, just talk real estate. Yeah. I'll put all your links below. I'll spell out your name. I'm glad you awesome. said it. I, I, <laughs> I said, I'm going to say it once I gave it a shot. So, you know, I, I got it, but I'm no, gonna, you got, you got it. It's easy <laughs> if you don't look at it, you just have to yeah. not look at it and then it's easy. So. That, that is true. But thanks for coming on. This has been a lot of fun. Great non-advice, but it was amazing. Great information. Thanks, thanks for having me. I, I enjoyed it. Thanks. Well, we'll keep in touch. Like I said, I'll probably reach out for some short-term rental information, but thanks for coming on and we'll talk again, Joe. Sounds good.